Hey all, Deke here. Uh, thanks for coming on and watching the video. Today we're taking a look at Rob Lake, GM, the man, the myth, the hope. Oh, Mr. Blake. Mr. Blake is getting a good bit of attention these days um, from Kings fans. Probably a good bit of unwanted attention uh, given the state of the Los Angeles Kings at this point. Uh, Mr. Blake is front and center whether he wants to be or not um, because obviously things are not going well. And by God, there needs to be some changes. And the question, of course, is what are those changes going to be? So let's look at him. The man. What about his pedigree? Well, we got a Hall of Fame player here. And we're talking about a guy who's won a cup, unfortunately, with the Avs, but he's lifted it. And uh, so there is a certain credibility uh, built into that. And if the Kings were looking to draft him uh, or trade for him as a defenseman, that would be important. Unfortunately, they're not. The mere fact that he was a good player doesn't necessarily mean he'll be a good GM. And before you start stomping on things, yes, I am aware of Mr. Eiserman, and he has been great. And yes, I would give my left arm for him to become the general manager of the Kings, but it's not going to happen. And unfortunately, there are plenty of other stories of uh, players who retired and became coaches or GMs, and it hasn't gone well. Just keep in mind, perhaps the greatest player ever, Mr. Gretzky, more or less ran uh, the uh, Arizona team for God knows how many years, and that didn't exactly go well. So, playing career. Okay, really, really nice. Really, really don't care. What about his role in management? Well, he worked at the uh, NHL offices, Department of Player Safety, and uh, he obviously developed so much sway that when the question of uh, Dowdy's suspension came up last year, it uh, didn't seem to matter much. I'm sure he learned some of the technical aspects of contracts and what have you, but I've never really understood what that whole argument is about uh, working in the offices and suddenly you somehow become a better GM. Nonetheless, he was highly thought of at one point, and you're going to find this hard to believe, but at one point he was actually considered for uh, the general manager position for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Shanahan openly talked about it. And uh, so that was interesting. I wonder what the Maple Leafs would look like now. Uh, and then, of course, he served as the assistant general manager to Dean Lombardi. Now, uh, this was after Hextall left. And this was, quite frankly, also during the thin years of the Lombardi tenure, when Dean couldn't let go of the idea that the window was closed and was just trading first-round picks for players like Sakara. Uh, that obviously didn't go well to the point that Dean's credibility ran out. He was given a nice pat on the ass and pushed out the door and told uh, you know, not to wait for the call. And uh, what role did Mr. Blake and Mr. Uh, Luke play in that process? I'm sure we will never know, although it would be great to have been a fly on the wall in that <laughs> those meetings. I can only imagine. So, uh, what about his credibility now with ownership? Obviously, he had quite a bit of it when he when he was brought in as GM. It was going to be a new age. He had a plan. So did Luke. Um, and right now, you have to think that the credibility of both of them, but particularly Blake's, probably running a bit low with ownership. And the reason why is uh, this last off season, uh, he sold ownership and he sold all of us on the idea that the window was open. And that the Kings could go places if only for the love of God they could find somebody that could put the net in the air, put the puck in the net. And thus we had Mr. Kovalchek. I know people have said, well, how do you know? Maybe he told ownership that, you know, it was iffy or what have you. And my answer to that is if he was telling ownership anything about a rebuild uh, being on the shelf, um, how do you explain Kovalchek? You don't go out and sign a 35 year old Russian guy if you're going to rebuild uh, in the next three years, the length of his contract. Maybe they thought they could go another two years and they would just eat Kovalchuk's contract the last year, you know, something of that sort. But I'm pretty confident that they thought they were going to be a lot better this year. And here's where I will raise my hand and I will not, not use revisionist history. I actually agreed with that view. I thought the Kovalchuk signing was great. And I thought that the Kings had a chance. Quick uh, showed last year in the playoffs. He's still on top of his game. The defense was great. The offense was abysmal. Hey, welcome to the Kings. Uh, and the idea that Kovalchuk could come in, we didn't have to give anybody up for him. It was just money. And if you got into the playoffs and you had Quick playing well and you had maybe Kovalchuk on the power play, taking nice soft passes from Kopi and slamming them into the net, well, you could get some visions uh, and some positive ones. Now, I think we can all agree that didn't happen. <laughs> 
as I sit here in January, January 12th, I believe today, the Kings are in dead last in the NHL. Not only did the window close, the entire building collapsed. And so Mr. Blake's uh, responsibility now is to come up with a plan. How's he going to fix it? And he's going to go into ownership and he's going to say, here are the problems and here's how we're going to fix it. But if your ownership, and this guy was just telling you six months ago that the window was still open and you only needed this old Russian dude to put you over the top, potentially, why are you going to believe in a solution? I mean, obviously, he just completely misjudged the team, uh, as did I. But, I mean, he's there. He's actually looking at the players and seeing them. I mean, how how do you get it so utterly wrong? And, uh, you know, I'm sure that's a, that's a question that he will ponder for a very, very long time. But regardless, I imagine his credibility level with ownership is pretty low. So that's, that's not good for him uh, moving forward. Uh, because ultimately the question is, who do you pick to rebuild this whole mess? And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Uh, the myth. The myth. So uh, every business that I've worked in, larger businesses, every sports team I've been on, uh, was basically taught one thing, that when things start going bad, the people in charge and particularly the people you know that are in key management positions have to come forward and they have to uh, take the heat. That's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the position. You need to come forward. You need to communicate. Take the blame, even if it's not your fault. Even if the quarterback suddenly developed a drinking problem, you know, right before the season and has been horrible, and your your NFL team is you know zero and sixteen, whose fault is that? Well, the GM needs to be out in front of that, as does the coach. Mister Blake has been noticeably absent. <laughs> In fact, uh, a lot of people like to refer to Velarde as a myth, but I would say Blake has really been the myth. I mean, he makes Lombardi look like a chatty caddy. Um, do we even know Rob Blake is alive? About the only thing that we've seen since the beginning of the season is the occasional press release um, with some you know quote uh, attributed to him for somebody going to the minors. And then, of course, we have the one ancient aliens proof piece of uh, evidence that he exists. And that's the picture of him at Bowling Green getting an award and apparently looking at a potential free agent player. I might note that when that picture was taken, the world junior championships were going on, you know, where all the prospects in the next draft are playing and he's in Bowling Green and the world junior championships are not being played in Bowling Green. Hmm. Not a good look at a minimum. Um, but, there you are. Uh, so rumor has it he's still alive. Uh, he hasn't said anything. And, um, you know, at this point you have to kind of wonder, well, is he like rolled up in a ball under the uh, the desk in the GM room, you know, weeping or what's going on here? You would think if nothing else, he would come forward and speak to the season ticket holders because at some point here, uh, Kings you know, management is going to be going out there and trying to get renewals for next season. The team's terrible, and it would be nice if somebody maybe came forward and offered a, a plan uh, to entice season ticket holders. It doesn't appear that's happened so far. So as far as his communication skills, Rob Blake gets a screaming F. Absolutely horrible. So what about hope? Is there any hope with this man? Can he lead us to the promised land? Um, in his defense, uh, this year was always going to happen. Maybe not this year, but sometime in the next two or three years. It was It was coming. Look, we have a core. The core is old. Uh, and at some point, uh, there was going to be a down year. Did anybody expect it to be this bad? No. Uh, did anybody expect it to be this early? No. Um, but a lot of players on this team, in fact, nearly everyone except maybe Clifford and Muzzin, have not only underperformed, but they've underperformed by leaps and bounds. Kopitar had 92 points last year. I thought he should have won the heart because he played center. He took all the hard shifts. He played penalty kill. He was just a much bigger, more important player than Hall. Uh, this year, I know he's a Kings fan favorite, but he he's embarrassing. He's on pace for 50 points. We're talking about scoring half the points that he scored last year. Now, he's picked it up lately. Full credit to him. Uh, but hey, wow, it would have been great maybe if in the first 20 games you had shown up, Mr. Kopitar. This is a guy who's a playmaker. He had two assists in the first 20 games. I don't care what team you are. If your number one center doesn't show up the first month and a half or two months of the season, you are screwed, and the Kings are screwed. Now, obviously, Kopitar is not uh, 
uh, you know, the biggest problem with this team. He's not uh, solely responsible for any of this stuff. I mean, you only have to look at Carter to Foley and well, frankly, you can name damn near every player at this point. Um, but, you know, there was something that happened with this team that went sideways uh, and it was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. Teams just, you know, father time, nobody beats it. Uh, you're seeing it with the Blackhawks, uh, the Rangers to their credit, you know, anticipated it and blew it up before then. Tampa Bay, they look awesome right now. They'll have the problem. Uh, Toronto, they'll have the problem, not immediately because they're so young, but in, you know, five, six years, I mean, every team goes through this. So, you know, in, the, in his defense, this was coming and, you know, there wasn't much he was going to be able to do about it. Nonetheless, uh, I think that, you know, the question is based on what he has done in the face of it and even just prior to it, you know, do you have much faith in him? So let's look at trades. I actually give him a great grade on trades. I know a lot of people are going back and, and hammering him on some of them. But, you know, the Gabrick trade, has Dion been good this year? No, it's been awful. Uh, and there's an article in The Athletic uh, here in January in, in which Dion says that, says I've been bad. Um, but you have to remember, Gabrick was uh, it was just a black hole and nobody expected him to ever get on the ice again uh, and, and when he did he was just man talk about disinterested <laughs> I, he might have got up to glide speed once or twice uh and you know the thought any of us you know thinking that that blake would be able to get rid of him it was a joke it was a dream and blake did and he got back dion and he got back thompson and dion was pretty solid last year uh, and even this year when he's been poor, you know, at least he's there and he's he's kind of mentoring the younger defenders and uh, acts as a counterweight to Dowdy screaming. Um, and then you also remember we also got Thompson out of it. And Thompson, I'm not a huge fan of him, but uh, this year, you know, he's been good. He's been very good this year for, you know, what role he fills. Uh, and so we had two players who actually play. I know what a concept uh, for a guy who, frankly, was done. And Guy Rick, I don't even think he's played this year with Ottawa. And I think we can probably all agree it's a pretty decent chance he'll never play again uh, or never be healed and, and ready to play until uh, the last day of his contract, in which he'll may make a miraculous recovery and try to get another contract from some other suckers. Um, so uh, in that trade, I give you know Blake an A- minus at least. At least he got something out of it. And it didn't cost the Kings jack. Uh, and the Tanner Pearson trade, I know, I know. He's scoring goals again. Um, but let's let's try and bring a little reality to this. One, I like Tanner Pearson. I'm happy for him. Uh, he obviously wasn't having a good time here, and uh, he was a guy who did a lot of the dirty work. I mean, last year he was standing in front of the net all the time, getting the crap beat out of him. You know, Muslin would shoot from the point. It would go past uh, Pearson, past the screen goalie. It would be a goal. Muslin would get a goal. Pearson wouldn't get any points because he didn't actually touch the puck. Uh, you know, and people would complain he didn't score. Uh, I would have much rather have kept Pearson than Toffoli, to be honest. Um, but, you know, he goes to Pittsburgh. Now he's playing with Malkin. I'm going to go out on a, a limb here and think that if you're playing with Malkin, you're probably going to score. <laughs> uh, Pittsburgh also plays uh, this whole new fancy thing called an offensive system where it's okay to go forward and try and score. Uh, and, you know, not everybody has to stand within five feet of the net and defend it with their life like the King style. Uh, <clears throat> so there's more chances there. And let's also be realistic. He scored eight goals. It's not like he's shooting for 50 here. You don't hear Sidney Crosby like begging for Tanner to be moved up to the first line. Nonetheless, I hope it works out for him. Uh, you know, good guy, good kid, and uh, hopefully he'll do well with it. Uh, what about Haglin, who we had coming back? Eh, he's Haglin. I mean, what did you expect? He is uh, fast, and he plays hard. And he's solid on defense. And he is serving a couple different roles with the Kings. One is he's going to bring a pick or a prospect when he's traded at the trade deadline. And two, I think he's opening the eyes of some people in Kings management to the realization of what Kempe is going to look like in 10 years. Uh, he is an older Kempe. And his hair is maybe not quite as nice. Um, but he's the kind of player that plays, and you see him during the game, and you notice him, and he shows off some good moves, and he's responsible defensively and everything else. And you get to the end of the 60 minutes, and you realize he didn't score in that game, and, oh, he also hasn't scored in 20 games. Uh, he's that kind of player. Uh, one GM in the NHL referred to Kempe as the tease uh, because just every once in a while he'll do something, score a goal, and you'll think, 
this is it. He's going to break out. And it just never happens. And that's Haglin. Uh, that is Kempe. And uh, this is probably a bad time to mention it, but I think that's Kapari. <laughs> so, so you know, it is what it is. Now, Kings fans, you also are going to have to accept uh, what's coming, which is a lot of these players are going to be traded and they're going to play better where they end up. Uh, Carter, if Carter goes and accepts a trade to wherever it is that he goes, he's going to play better. And you know why? Because he couldn't play any worse. Uh, boy, you talk about a guy who looks uninterested on the ice. It's Jeff Carter. Toffoli, Toffoli's, you know, he's getting chances. At some point, he's going to start scoring them, and it'll probably not be with us. Um, in the off season, we're also going to be signing a lot of guys to one- and two-year contracts, and you're going to wonder why, because they're going to be mm, mediocre players. We're not signing them because we're hoping that they're going to turn it into anything with our team. We're signing them because we want to trade them next trade deadline and get more picks, more prospects. That's how you build these teams. Uh, go back and look at the teams that you think are so great now, and you'll see that's how they did it. Maple Leafs, Kapanen, skating on the first line until recently when uh, uh, Nylander came back. You know, Kapanen came, uh, he was a Pittsburgh prospect. He was a Penguins prospect, and uh, he came in the trade for Hot Dog, uh, you know, as part of that deal. Uh, and you might be surprised to learn that the Maple Leafs are actually still paying part of Hot Dog's uh, salary. Uh, because they took that back as part of the trade. Um, you know, and this is what's going to happen. The Maple Leafs, you know, if you don't know who Hot Dog is, it's uh, Kessel. Um, but uh, you're going to see, um, you know, a lot of trades like that. You're going to see the Kings pull back salary, whatever it is. But that's how you build teams. You, you need to get quantity on the draft picks because uh, some draft picks don't work out. Uh, uh, who was the kid in Edmonton who was taken number one overall? He was supposed to be the next great thing. He's not even in the NHL anymore, the Russian kid. Um, you know, that's, that's life. You need quantity, uh, in addition to quality on the draft picks. Cause you know, Velarde, I mean, you have all these kinds of things that come up. Um, so anyways, that's, what's going to happen. So what about the drafts? Well, um, uh, Mr. Blake, uh, you know, drafts are, they're lotteries. I mean, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't look at Pasternak and, uh, Boston is on the first lane scoring goals like a madman the last couple of years. He looks like a God on the ice. He wasn't a top 10 pick. Um, he just wasn't, you know, and so you can find talent in different places, but you really need to be looking for particular types of players. And the Kings just don't, I baffled by some of the players they pick in the last two drafts. You know, who are the players that they pick that are scores? I mean, the Kings need scoring. I think we can all agree on that. And they pick Velarde. Velarde is a great score. He'll go to the net. He, he will shoot. He's got an NHL shot. Talent moves around the net. You get, you get near the net. You give him the puck, get the hell out of the way. Cause he's gone. Um, but you have this injury. So, <laughs> uh, anybody that knows what's going on with that right now is, uh, you know, please comment below because it's the grand mystery. Uh, and then you have Kapari. These are the last two first round picks. I watched every world junior championship game with Finland. I've watched a bunch of video of his, his professional team. This guy's not a scorer. He's not, um, he will score, secondary goals, not goals that he causes. He, he's, you know, he'll be standing by the side of the net. Somebody passes across the goal mouth. And he pumps it in, but he's not a guy that takes the puck at the middle of the ice and, you know, goes flying into the zone and scores. That's just not who this guy is. And you go, I mean, even during the world championship broadcast, they were talking about him when he was dominating a game and they were complimenting him and said, but he's never going to be a scorer. And they're right. You go watch his pro games. First of all, the pro team he plays on is far better than anybody else in the league. Second, um, the goals that he's scoring again, either they're cases where there's just no defense, the defense is just awful, um, or he's somebody who's you know hammering in a rebound or something like that. It's not to say he's a bad player or anything like that. Uh, he's a guy who can probably put up 40 points you know, a year, second line wing or center maybe. Um, but you know, he's another Kempe. He's another Kempe. He's probably scored more than Kempe, but he's that kind of a guy. He's not as fast as Kempe. I don't know what what the hell people are talking about when they say that. Uh, maybe he is in a straight line, but when he's on the ice with the puck or without the puck, he's he's fast, but he's not a burner. Um, so you know, <laughs> he's just another guy who's I don't really see how he solves the Kings' problems. Uh, what about the lower round picks? Anderson Dolan, love him. Kid's got third line center written all over him. He looks like Jarrett Stoll without all the uh, the baggage. Um, you know, just a good kid, highly competitive, kind of guy you need on your team to win. Is he a guy that's going to, you know, help you score? Man, I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, Thomas, 
looks good on his team, but he wasn't even invited to the Canadian, uh, you know, junior team uh, tryouts. Uh, as far as I know, he certainly wasn't invited to the camp. Uh, that's not a great sign. Um, you know, you got uh, Bullet, Bullet, the kid over in Russia. Uh, again, another kind of mystery pick. Uh, kid is supposed to have a lot of offensive moves and be a sniper. But he's really young. He's uh, you know, had only played in the minors up to this point. He's playing in the pro league, the KHL now, but he's doing horribly. Not so much because of his skill or anything, but he's only been given five minutes a night. He's playing like on the fourth line. He's being, uh, uh, you know, Willie Desjardins. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't know how that's supposed to be helping his development. Who knows if we ever even see him over here. This kid is from a really backwards area. I, you know, the idea of traveling, I don't know if he's ever even been out of Russia before. Uh, so the idea of him coming to LA and suddenly saving the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would view him as a luxury if he does show up. So you look at the Kings prospect line and wow, it's bleak. Um, you know, there are some uh, players that you like love and these guys, you know, and they're great. And I think they've been great on the team coming up. A lot of energy, you know, Wagner, these kinds of guys, but they're not top six guys. They're just, they're just not. Um, and there's a big gap in the, the Kings prospects. I don't know where we find these. Now we have prospects in other areas that are great. You know, Mickey, uh, Mikey Anderson, the defender who played for uh, the United States in the World Junior Championships, looks like a top two defensive pairing waiting to happen. The kid was really, really impressive. Phillips with Canada looks like he can be a second or third pairing defenseman. He's a stay at home kind of guy. Um, you know, and so you have those guys and you have Brickley and, and some of the college free agents. And that's another area, college free agents. Obviously, I think Blake gets an A-plus in here. I follow Peterson, uh, Brickley, you know, all outstanding. Is done really well there. I, I mean, I don't see how you can knock him at all. Um, but if, if you go back and you look at college free agents over time, uh, you know, and you see teams competing for them, they're trying to get them to sign with the teams, then you kind of never really hear from them again. They certainly don't become dominant players. I think Peterson has a chance. He looked great in goal. I mean, he looks like this guy's going to be a stud and could be the Kings goalie for the next 10 years. Um, but other than that, eh, you know, I follow a nice player. Is he ever going to be a big scorer? No. Brickley looks like, you know, he's got some defects in his game, but they can be fixed and he can be a consistent defenseman. Um, you know, but again, where where are we getting goal scoring from? And I don't see it. So I'm not nearly as high on the drafts, um, you know, that other people are with Blake. Uh, and then, you know, we have the final factor that's out there, and it's kind of the wild card factor, and that's he who shall not be named, Mr. Hextall. Yes, yes, the Hex. Uh, obviously, he's a known source, a known resource to the King's ownership. He was here during the glory of the years with Lombardi. And then he went to the Flyers. Uh, obviously, got fired this year. However, as a Flyers fan, I would tell you be careful about reading a lot into that. Uh, Flyers are a very political organization. There was clearly a power struggle between uh, Hextall and Holmgren, and I think it's safe to say Hextall lost. Was Hextall perfect as the Flyers GM? God no, God no. For some reason, he wouldn't go sign a, a reliable goalie. I don't know why, and he chose the wrong coach. His Hextall or. Um, whatever his name was, was getting just outcoached by everybody. I mean, a dog sleeping on, uh, you know, on your driveway could outcoach him. It was just awful, just awful. Um, and I know everybody loves Ian LaPerriere, great player. I loved him as a player too. Awful, awful assistant coach. He was in charge of fire special teams, and they were just terrible. Um, so a lot of problems there. But when it comes to building a prospect line, uh, Hextall was fabulous. When he got to the Flyers, they were in salary cap hell. Um, the, the NHL team was devoid of any real direction uh, or any success. And uh, the prospect line was barren. Sound like a team, you know? Yes, that would pretty much be the same exact situation with the Kings. Um, we're in salary cap hell, whether you know it or not. I think if you go look at cap friendly, we have, oh, I want to say maybe like $40,000 in cap space. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yes, this 31st place team is up against the cap. Um, but Hextall was able to build a, a tremendous and impressive prospect line. He brought in players like uh, Provlov, uh, Ghost, uh, Kachelny, uh, Sanheim, um, you know, a lot of talent that he's brought up. He got lucky. 
uh, and drafted Nolan Patrick second over, overall, you know, jumped up in the draft. Um, you know, Patrick's not playing well, but, um, you know, from a draft position perspective, you can understand why he did it. Uh, if you watch the World Junior Championships, you saw Morgan Frost on Canada, a very impressive player. Uh, that's a Hextall pick. Uh, Jay O'Brien, who was on Canada, that's a Hextall pick. There were tons of Flyers prospects there. Um, so the Flyers are in a unique position in that they're very young. They need a coach who knows what he's doing and his discipline. Mr. Sutter would probably do very well there. Um, but Hextall rebuilt that organization from the ground up, and he got him out of salary cap hell. And he uh, did a hell of a job. And so then the question becomes, well, would you trust Hextall to rebuild the Kings, or would you trust Blake? Hextall's done it before. He has tangible results. Ownership knows him. Blake hasn't done it before, um, and he has a credibility problem. And so you can see where I'm headed. If I was the owner of the LA Kings, and God, I wish I was, wouldn't that be great? Uh, I would have fired Rob Blake the day Ron Hextall was let go. <laughs> and I would have picked up Hextall. And I would have told Luke, Luke, you are one of my favorite players. You are a great man, a great president for this company. However, uh, you are no longer involved in the hockey operations. Instead, you work on the business side. You take care of all that stuff. And then I would tell Hextall, you can do whatever you want with the scouts, with the development guys, except for Ranford uh, and Dusty. I'm giving them a raise and a new contract, and they're sticking around. But you can fire everybody else, bring in who you want, whatever it is you want to do, and you have four years. And you get me back into the playoffs with a tangible, credible basis for uh, making a run at the cup, or you're fired. And I would get the hell out of his way and let him do whatever he's going to do. And I would make sure to do that now because it's before the trade deadline and the offseason when he can start moving players. And, of course, that would all go well seamlessly. There would be no detours and no problems with it. Uh, it's just like picking lottery numbers. So there you go. Uh, that's the video today. Rob Blake, GM, the man, the myth, the hope. I don't think so. So until the next video, have a good one.